sure thing. Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Tim Thornton. I'm director of the School of Political Economy here in Melbourne, uh, but also a senior research fellow with the Economics in Context Initiative at Boston University and the Global Development and Environment Institute at Tufts University in Boston. And um, I'm also uh, connected with the Journal of Australian Political Economy, which is a journal that was established in uh, 1977. And it provides uh, political economic perspectives on contemporary capitalism that's broader and more plural and interdisciplinary in focus than most economic journals. The journal continues to foster debates about the interactions between capital, technology, the state and the environment. And it's uh, particularly in an Australian context and it's uh, designed to cater to both a specialist academic readership, but also a general audience. And it's ex uh, most of its articles are accessible to, um, to a general audience. Yeah, look, that's a, that's a great way to start. Uh, political economy is the traditional name for economics up until the 1870s, uh, what we now call uh, economics today was political economy and um, uh, so in in the contemporary world the, the term political economy is used quite loosely and and flexibly and often you, you kind of uh, are taken aback by it but I uh, work off a traditional understanding of the word which is is to say uh, the focus is on understanding the social provisioning process uh, how people get the goods and services they need to flourish and how you sustain that over time environmentally. Uh, and in a lot of ways that is an identical focus to, to economics. Uh, the, the difference is the political, econ uh, political economy approach is uh, more internally diverse, uh, more plural and more interdisciplinary, more open to co-informing dialogue uh, with the insights of other disciplines. But ultimately the questions get down to working out what goods and services are produced, how are they produced, for whom are they produced, so questions of distribution, and also how um, you know production and distribution is uh, maintained over time. It's got to be environmentally sustainable or, or um, it's a big problem. So yeah, that's I think that's the nub of political economy and, and economics and, and so same target area but just a, the breadth of approach is a little different between the two what I would essentially regard as two uh, similar but separate disciplines. Look, uh, interest rates are essentially the price of m borrowing money. If you went to the bank and asked for a hundred dollar loan uh, and you were deemed to be uh, credit worthy, you had a good credit history and some collateral, they'd lend you a hundred dollars maybe and say uh, you've got to pay it back in 12 months uh, plus an, an additional five dollars uh, as the fee for us lending you this money. So in that instance you would say oh, that's an interest rate of five percent. Um, and so uh, people pay interest when they borrow money but then if you deposit money in, in the bank if you uh, put $100 in the bank, the bank might uh, give you 4% interest on that uh, as a, a sort of enticement not to put it under your mattress at home, but to put it in the bank uh, so that they can do things with those deposits. Uh, and, you, and obviously there's a difference, there's always a bit of a spread or a difference between what the bank pays depositors and what it charges um, uh, people that take out loans and that's uh, the bank's uh, profit margin uh, or, 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 or an important part of it anyway. So inflation is really just a general rise in prices, like a, a rise in the average price level. Particular things might go up, uh, you know, for a, a Taylor Swift concert or uh, an iceberg lettuce because there's been a bad season. We don't normally see, that, well, in fact, we don't say that's inflationary because it's just a particular price. Inflation is about prices in general rising. Uh, because, uh, and that avoids a problem uh, whereby, you know, the price of some goods might go up, but the price of other goods might fall. So you, you kind of really need to take an average overall picture. Uh, and inflation is, uh, yeah, it's been a common feature 
of uh, market economies in, in the 20th century. In the previous century, they sort of uh, less of a problem. And, and in fact, if there was an issue, it was deflation, which was a, a sort of fall in prices. Now, that sounds fantastic, but it's actually uh, in many ways even more tricky than inflation uh, as, a, as an issue in the economy. Well, the thing is, if the real value of money is, in, is increasing, uh, that's a real problem if you've got a debt, like if you take out a loan for a million dollars and uh, that will stay. But if your wages fall or if you're a business and the prices you charge for your products have got to fall, you've still got that million dollar loan uh, that was uh, given in essentially yesterday's money. So what it really means is that the real value of your debt has increased. Uh, and there's also an issue that if the, the price of money is falling all the time, it's a bit of an incentive to just hang on to your money. If you're thinking, oh, it's going to go buy that car, but gee, it was uh, $20,000 uh, last month and it's $19,000 this month. Maybe if I wait around, it'll fall another thousand. And so uh, for those sorts of problems, deflation can be a bit diabolical. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I think uh, most people have probably got a pretty good idea about what an in, unemployment is. is. You've got workers in the economy who are both willing and able uh, uh, to work, but they can't find work. Uh, and um, this has been, um, yeah, uh, this is a real social scourge. Uh, you know, it's, it's terrible for those people, but it's also just a, a waste for uh, the economy. You've got all these people uh, who ready and willing to produce goods and services that we need, but they um, they can't get a go. Uh, the causes of, in, of um, unemployment uh, vary from situation to situation, and also, uh, to, su to some extent, economists can disagree about the causes of inflation and its solutions. In the, uh, some, uh, in the 1930s, uh, traditional microeconomic analysis said, well, look, if there's... Uh, a lot of unemployment around, it must be because the price of labour is too high. It's a little bit like at a fruit and vegetable market, if the price of carrots is really high, there's a surplus of carrots, what do you do? Lower the price of carrots, problem solved. And and so uh, up until the time of Keynes, people thought, well, that's essentially how you solve unemployment. Workers have just got to suck it up and work for less. Keynes argued, no, labour markets are special because if you zoom the camera lens out, you kind of think, well, actually a great source of demand for goods and services in the economy are people's wages. If you cut their wages, they're going to spend less. And if everybody's spending less across the economy, uh, that's a big problem for business. And so uh, in certain circumstances, and I, and I stress the importance of context, cutting wages uh, could actually make unemployment worse. Um, but uh, these things are all, um, uh, economics is a real contest of ideas, so I, I don't want to uh, uh, put forward a single truth. I, it, it's much better for students to shop around and um, make informed judgments about competing approaches, but um, that would certainly be the one I, I would lead with when people want to start thinking about unemployment, the fact that it's kind of uh, macroeconomic in nature quite a bit of the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I sort of, uh, I'm an older guy, I'm in my 50s now, like growing up in the 1970s in Australia, uh, the, the workforce today is very different. It's a lot more casualised, uh, less secure work around. Uh, uh, gig economy is a big thing uh, in the sector, uh, the, the tertiary education sector, like most people working in there have not got permanent work. And so there's been this rise in what uh, a guy called uh, Guy Standing calls the precariat, but people aren't necessarily in poverty, but they're sort of thinking, will I renew my contract? Or uh, so that that lack of security, and that's uh, quite a few moving parts are behind that. Probably the decline in union membership and thus union power, changes to industrialisation, uh, forces of global competition. It's it's a sort of bigger story. Look, the gig economy, uh, and in, in some ways, probably the, the uh, some people, you know, uh, school students and the like that might be looking at this might be already in the gig economy itself. It's those 
the best examples are those big platforms like uh, Uber Eats um, or um, Airbnb. Oh, not so much. Oh, Airbnb is supplying a service or Airtasker, uh, where uh, usually online you're, you're just picking up odd jobs. Uh, you're not uh, usually understood to be a formal employee. You might be able to choose your hours, but then you also might be under certain pressures. Um, and so it, sometimes from an individual perspective, this can suit particular individuals. But if you zoom out from a system-wide level, uh, there are uh, you know, reasonable arguments that are made that ultimately this undermines the amount of more secure jobs in the economy and, and can undermine things. So, so there's tensions uh, to navigate there. And I, I think currently the the current federal government is kind of wrestling with this uh, and and trying to provide flexibility, uh, not just for employers, uh, but employees, but also to do so in a way that doesn't upset the general imbalance between uh, capital and labour or employers and employees. So it's a, a kind of very interesting area. And as a society, ultimately, I think we need to think about if we need to make trade-offs, where, where should those trade-offs be? Yeah, look, it, it's used differently. Uh, it can be a, a wonderful thing at its best. It's saying, well, you and your employer can uh, work out a, a more flexible work arrangement. Maybe instead of working from nine to five, you can work from seven to three and avoid peak hour traffic or pick your kids up from school. Maybe you only want to work two or three days a week so you can pursue other things that are important to you. And so that is, uh, that's, that's generally great. Um, and it's hard to sort of think of too many reasons why one would be critical about that. Uh, but uh, flexible work uh, for employers can sometimes mean, well, actually, I want to convert you, your permanent job to casual or I want you to... Um, you know, I'll allow you to work at home, but you've got to be on uh, call pretty much from 7am to midnight. Or uh, So it, a lot of things are a little double-edged and you've got to, um, rather than just getting out the cheer squad about everything, sometimes it's good to uh, notice the ambiguities, the, the contradictions and tensions, and then design policies and other measures around that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, I think everybody agrees that businesses have some responsibility to follow uh, the law. Um, uh, beyond that, there can be expectations that uh, businesses will, will look up after their stakeholders beyond just boosting their profits, so their employees, the environment, the wider society. Um, and a lot of people don't find that objectionable. Probably where it gets interesting is the extent to which uh, government has got to regulate social responsibility versus depending on the kind of goodwill or other forces to promote uh, social responsibility or alternatively depending on industry self-regulation. So that's, that's probably where it gets really interesting. But the concept of social responsibility is businesses thinking beyond just their bottom line. Yeah, look, the gender gap, uh, yeah, I, not exclusively, but I, I guess usually understood as a gap between uh, where women aren't getting uh, a fair amount of pay, opportunity or status, uh, you know, that they're, yeah, they're not getting a fair deal. And so in things like wages, there still is a gap of, of men generally getting paid more than women. And so this is, yeah, it's obviously unfair. And it's also... Uh, bad for women but ultimately bad for the society and bad for the economy because it's it's kind of really holding us back and stopping people realizing their potential and it, it's in some ways it's everybody's responsibility to try to close that gap uh there are things that can be done at the policy level there are things that individual businesses and businesses associate business associations can change but even for ordinary people it's a matter of just being aware when you might have some uh, kind of gender bias or somebody says something that you think doesn't quite add up, well, if you safely can, point that out to them, you know, because it's also about changing attitudes and norms. 
And um, certainly there's a gender gap in, in economics and political economies. Too many blokes. Uh, so I I'm always encourage, uh, whenever I've taught both economics or political economy, either in the university system or, or with the School of Political Economy, uh, yeah, it's always, I've always felt it's my responsibility and privilege to try to close that gap. And um, it, it'd be a good thing if we did. Well, okay, well, probably define what superannuation is. It's it's something that your employer makes uh, a payment on your behalf into a special superannuation account on top of your wages. So if you're paid, it's, I think currently it's around 11%. So if you've got some casual job, you paid $100 a week, your employer will give you that money, probably minus uh, income tax, but th they would pay 11% or $11 into your super account. And then once you turn 65, you get that uh, money back plus any uh, investment uh, income it, it, all that money is invested so you get any returns on investment that occur during that time so in some senses young people don't have to worry about it too much because it's automatically taken care uh, of it for them they haven't really got much say in it actually it's compulsory they might uh, like to uh, contribute a, more than 11 percent if they like because uh, super is uh, voluntary contributions and also uh, mandatory contributions are a lot more lightly taxed. Uh, probably the what young people should focus on is whether the rules around super are sufficiently fair, like maybe the taxation concessions you get, uh, incentives to put money into super are just too much. Uh, there's been interesting work done by the Grattan Institute saying about uh, I hope I can remember this correctly, but uh, probably two-thirds of uh, the, the tax benefits of super flow to the top 20 wealthiest Australians. So there's kind of equity issues around that. It's a whole... And a lot of people that support mandatory superannuation still say we haven't got the uh, regulations and arrangements around this correct just yet. So young people in some ways are disadvantaged by the current rules, many would argue. So that's that would be the entry point. I would encourage young people to engage with super and to just make sure that there there's not intergenerational unfairness. Ah, well, that's a, an interesting uh, and controversial question. A lot of questions in economics are controversial. We shouldn't shy away from that. Uh, the first thing that jumps out at me about saying that, because we're currently in, in an inflationary episode, is probably wages aren't leading inflation. It's it's probably more of a case that prices are, you know, prices might go up 5% in a year and wages might try to scramble behind that at 3 or 4% a year and not really even quite keep up. And so you could make a, make a case that primarily... Uh, the nature of inflation at the moment is more from prices to wages. It changes over time. In the 1970s, you're probably on stronger ground to say that, uh, you know, because uh, labour bargaining power was stronger during that time, that maybe it could uh, start off with a wage rise, which could cause prices to rise, which might then induce another wage rise. So that's a wage price spiral. Um, and students are often taught about that. But I, I think at the moment it's a more open question to, to argue whether um, the movement is first in, in the prices of businesses and, and wages are just belatedly trying to catch up. Uh, up until the current inflationary episode where the Reserve Bank started to get worried about um, wages, uh, wage rises, they were worried that wages weren't keeping up. And that's because ultimately... It holds back people's standard of living. Most people are wage earners. Uh, and ultimately, it, it can hold back consumption in the economy. If, if wages aren't keeping rise uh, with uh, other prices, well, then who's, uh, workers are going to be able to buy less and less goods and services. And that's a major headache for business. So that's a type of underconsumption argument. And so that's one of the, the reasons why we should be concerned uh, about stag stagnating wages. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think, I, I don't think many people would deny that it's important. You want people at the top of organisations that are kind of competent, 
that can give some sort of good example in terms of their conduct and their ethics and their morals. They've got to be intelligent. Uh, they've got to be able to have some sort of plan and, and implement that plan. Uh, you know, you uh, that sort of uh, competence and, and example is very important. I think what can sometimes get lost, uh, people can get maybe too carried away with leadership and look for the Messiah leader and we've got to put, give them many millions of dollars and maybe drop the ball in also appreciating that it's also just as important to have good processes and rules within organisations and other groups to ensure that, uh, you know, things are fair and people can be motivated if they work hard, they get the reward, that people aren't free riding, that if there's disputes, they can be settled in a logical way. Um, and so I really like, um, there's uh, been a guy called David Sloan Wilson, who's built on the Nobel Prize winner in economics, Eleanor Ostrom's work on uh, management of common resources and he's applied those to say oh there's these eight principles of group design and if you implement these design principles your group will work better and so probably what I would like to see more of in Australian discussions around uh, leadership and company management is maybe less of a focus on looking for the next messiah leader and more focus on just having good processes and formal and also informal rules within organizations to promote productivity and uh, adaptability and agility and all of those things.